Hi, I'm Mike from Craft Supplies USA and today I'm going to show you how to turn a baby rattle. It's a very fun project that doesn't require a lot of expensive materials and they're fairly quick to make. I have a few different shapes and varieties of, of baby rattles here. This first one is more of like a Victorian style rattle. This is probably my favorite shape that I've done out of these. Um, this one's more of a maraca style with some, with some beads on the handle. Um, and the tone is a little bit different between these two. So the design possibilities are really up to you. There's a bunch of different shapes out there. If you go on the internet and look up uh, vintage baby rattles, there's a ton of different styles you can kind of mimic. Um, but let's get into the blank selection and we can start turning. Let's talk about blank selection. For this piece and the rattle I'm turning today, I'm gonna use a two by two by six and this is some kiln dried maple. Reason I want it to be kiln dried is I'm gonna be gluing the handle to the top here and I don't want the hole or the handle to warp and come loose as after I give it as a gift. So make sure your material is dry. The other thing you wanna make sure is you don't have a toxic type of wood. Um, there's a lot of material out there that has known allergies to people like you, walnut, um, coca bolo, a lot of those materials um, some people are allergic to, so stay away from those. And you can always look up on like a wood database website to see if they have allergies. Um, but maple, this will be a good piece. Uh, it'll look really well and it'll hold up over time as well. So two by two by six, we can go ahead and mount this in our chuck and we can rough it down and give ourselves a tenon and then flip it around. And then we can start the turning process. Before we start turning, I'm gonna get my safety glasses on. Obviously wear some uh, eye protection and dust protection whenever you're turning. I'll be using a, revol a revolving center here. And when I mount this in the chuck, I'm gonna start out by mounting this just on the four points in the chuck jaws. And I'll turn a 10 in on the tail stock end that we can then flip around and have a more secure hold with. Whenever I mount on the, uh, a square piece like this that's not perfectly square, a lot of times the center point's off a ways. So I'll just get my T-handle and adjust my center point and get that centered a little bit better so I don't waste as much material. And then we can bring up our revolving center for support. Go ahead and set up your tool rest. Standard working height. Make sure that spins freely and doesn't hit the tool rest. And then I'm just gonna snug up the pinion gears. Make sure you tighten both of these. All right, one more spin. Everything's clear and free. I'll be using my spindle roughing gouge to rough this down to round, and then we'll put a tenon on this end. As far as our turning speed, because this is spindle stock, we can be turning fairly fast. About 2000 RPM here. Just working the material down, I don't want to be too aggressive. Just let that wood come right off onto the tool. Beautiful thing about the spindle roughing gouge is it makes really light work of spindle work. It removes a lot of material really fast. And it's easy to control as well. I'm gonna rotate that flute over start peeling on this end. All right, now that I've roughed that to round, I'm gonna use my skew, do a little peel cut here and give myself a tenon for my chuck jaws. So I'm gonna start with that handle low on the bevel and then raise the handle for a peel cut. And then I'm gonna also true up the end there because that base is a little uneven and give myself a little chamfer. Let's go and inspect our tenon here. It looks nice and clean, good shoulder. Can remove our tail stock now and then remount this with the tenon. The reason I wanna put a tenon on this piece is because I will be turning a portion of this unsupported from the, t from the tail stock here and I wanna have as secure a grip as I can have. Um, gripping on a square piece of stock like this um, isn't very secure, so you always want to avoid that as much as possible. 
I'm gonna tighten that up, both pinion gears, make sure those are really nice and tight. Then we'll bring up our revolving center again while we rough this down and get this all to round. Give that a spin, make sure it still free, freely spins. And now we can finish roughing this down with the roughing gouge. Whenever I use the spindle roughing gouge, you notice me keep my hand over the top of the flute. Um, it's not as efficient as letting the chips just go straight out of the bottom of the flute, but it prevents a lot of the chips from flying down my shirt and getting all over the shop. So, you can play around with that and see if that works for you. But now let's go ahead and lay out our dimensions for the handle. I've got about a quarter inch of waste material here from the center point. That's all gonna be damaged material here that we're gonna turn away. Overall length of the handle roughly there and then I'm gonna have about a 3 8 of a tenon. So handle length, 3 8 quarter to 3 8 hand, or sorry, tenon here and then we've got our waste material on the end. And for the cap, this top piece, right about there. And then the rest of that's gonna be for our jam chuck. One thing I forgot to mention, um, the overall diameter of this is about 5 eighths at the largest point. So I, got, I have a lot of material here I'm gonna reduce with my spindle roughing gouge and get that a lot smaller before we start cutting our cove and our bead. Also, now that our blank is round and it's in a chuck on a tenon, I'm gonna speed this up a little bit and I'm gonna bring in my tool rest to give me just a little more support. The speed went from about 1800 RPM, now we're at 2200 RPM. Use my skew as a peel cut. And these dimensions I put on here are a fairly rough dimension. This is just based on the style that I liked. You can play around with the length of the handle versus the, the overall diameter and size of the head here. You could shorten it, lengthen it out. There's so many different varieties of baby rattles on, out there that people have made before, so um, play around with different styles as well. Uh, but just to show you guys, we, again, we have some waste here, our tenon. I'll turn this on and slow it down a little bit. Our tenon length is gonna be from the shoulder here to there, roughly. Um, I'm just gonna mark a center point for my bead that I wanna put on there, a little decorative bead in the center. Um, but that's gonna be our handle. So I'll reduce the diameter about another quarter inch or so, and then we can start putting our decorative beads in coves. All right, I'm gonna stop here for just a second. Um, when we hollow out the top of the baby rattle, I'll be using an 11 seconds Forstner bit, or sorry, an 11 16 Forstner bit. Um, reason I use that is because it's a repeatable dimension that I drill this out with every time and it makes um, fitting the tenons really fast and simple. So what I like to do is I'll get my calipers, set this to the diameter of the Forstner bit, and then I'll open them up just slightly, just in case so if I overshoot the tenon, I still have enough room to make a tight fit. I want to size the tenon now, and that'll establish my overall diameter here, as well as the length, and then that'll give me a reference mark of where I can turn my half bead to on the handle. So this is what the handle looks like when it's not attached. So we're going to be doing a half bead to our tenon, 
and we're going to size the tenon to fit that 11 16 Forstner bit, which I have my caliper set to. I'll be using a parting tool to set my tenon length and diameter. Let's give that a test fit. Okay, I've got about a sixteenth or so left to go. Now that I'm really close, I'm only gonna cut half the tenon width. Just in case I undersize that, I still have the larger half of the tenon I could reuse. That way you're giving yourself an out just in case you screw up the tenon fit right now. Uh, really, really close there. The other reason I oversize the tenon is because these wood fibers on the tenon will compress when I press the two parts together, and I want to make sure I still have enough um, diameter there where it's not going to be a loose fit. All right, so that's just barely slipping over there. I'm going to I'm going to fit the other half of the tenon to match now. Okay, and that is our tenon. So from here, I'm going to reduce the diameter of this slightly. Okay, so now we're about an inch in diameter. I'm going to grab my spindle gouge and start giving myself the half bead on the front end near the tenon as well as the half bead on the back side there. Get my pencil, mark out my center point. Maple is just a really nice wood, cuts really well. Doing half beads is a real joy with maple. All right, that's pretty close. I'm gonna leave some of that material there once I get rid of the tailstock. But now I wanna show you something kinda of cool. So to do that center bead, um, you can definitely do that with a spindle gouge, um, but Easywood Tools has just come out with these new beading cutters. These are actually really nice. Um, they have a negative rate grind to them, so they're not too aggressive. Um, but they make doing beads really consistent and repeatable. Um, and, and this one I actually leave, I leave on my tool all the time because I use it quite a bit. This is the 3 16 They have four different sizes, but for me the 3 16 is the most usable size for most projects. Um, but it just makes it very consistent and repeatable, especially if you're doing sequences of beads. Um, you want those to be all symmetrical as far as the width and diameter and everything. So um, having that be consistent, it just makes it a lot quicker. Right here from this point, I'm gonna cut and establish my bead. I'm gonna raise up the tool handle slightly as well. And then once we get our bead established, then we can create our cove to the side of the bead. And the other thing too is once the bead is cut, we can lengthen and uh, change the shape of the bead a little bit once it's already cut. So there's a couple things I've learned using these tools. You wanna be fairly gentle when you initiate the cut. So I'm going to start and just center that pencil line between the cutters. They're the cutting points here on each side. And I've got the handle above center. And just advance that in. And then I like to just wag the handle back and forth, wiggle it back and forth, until I get my bead cut. So handle slightly above center, and then just wiggle that back and forth, left to right, and you can see that bead start forming and then the pencil line will disappear. Right there. So if I stop the lathe, you can see we've got a really nice clean cut bead. Now I can get my spindle gouge and start cutting my cove to the side of the bead.
So just using the 3 8 spindle gouge. Get our cove in. I'm using these two fingers here as a fulcrum. I'm just pivoting that tool around to make the cut I need. Just trying to get that a nice smooth flowing curve. Spindle gouge is a great tool to do that with. One thing I've done as well is I've given myself a double bevel grind here. I've, re I've removed that heel of the tool so it doesn't leave tool marks for me and it gives me a little more room to work. Rotate that over. Make sure the flute's closed. All right, so this side is the diameter I want to be at, and I'm going to match the left side up to it. Just pick up that cut and make a nice flowing curve. And at this point, that bead is really tall and it's too big for the size of handle that we have. It just looks out of proportion. The nice thing is I can get that beading cutter and go straight back onto the bead and reduce the diameter of it. So just wiggle the handle back and forth. And you can see now we've reduced the diameter of that bead. It looks a lot better. I still think that's a little bit too large. Just reduce that a little bit, handle above center, move that handle side to side as well. And that looks a lot better. And now I just want to match up the, the diameter on each side of the bead to where they're symmetrical. Okay, that looks pretty good. Now I'm going to finish the half round on this side. Actually, I'm going to reduce the length of that a little bit. If you're having a hard time getting a flowing curve with your spindle gouge, you could definitely use your skew. This skew is a little bit too wide. If you had a half inch skew, you could go in there and give that nice radius sweep you need. Uh, but this spindle gouge is going to give me a really clean surface so I don't have to sand as much. So ideally use a spindle gouge, um, but if you can't do it with that, um, use a skew or a scraper to cut that. Uh, it looks like I need to clean up the detail on each side of the bead just a little bit more. And it looks a little heavy on the top end here, so I'm going to reduce some of that size. On something like this, I don't want to make the handle too thin and delicate, something that could be broken in half easily. Uh, I want to reduce the safety hazard on this as much as possible. So make it durable out of solid timber and make sure the diameters are still something that will be durable. Uh, this is roughly 3 8 maybe 7 16 here in the center. Nah, eh, it's probably 3 8 um, If it go any smaller than that, um, kids could probably break them a little bit easier, so just be careful with that. And I'm just trying to smooth out that curve, give myself a nice pleasing shape. A lot of times it helps to just stand back from the piece and look at the top of the horizon and you can see those lines because they stand out a lot better. My bead isn't perfectly in center, but that's okay. Uh, my, my half rounds here and there look pretty good. I will remove the tailstock here in just a second to clean up the end. Uh, but my tenon's good there, the bead looks nice and crisp. I've got uh, even matching diameter on both sides of the bead. So let's go ahead and remove the tailstock. And then finish turning that off and getting rid of that uh, uh, center point from the revolving center. 
Right now, because we're on a smaller piece, fairly thin, it will probably chatter. So one thing you can do is you can help support it with your support hand and pre prevent some of the chatter that you usually get. And I'm just lightly supporting it. It's not, I'm not gripping that tight enough to get hot. I'm just letting that spin freely in my fingers. But just enough to help it prevent that thing from whipping around and getting out of control. I'm making a bevel riding cut here. Uh, one thing to note is I am trying to float the bevel as much as possible. And that means I want to be on the bevel, but not enough to where it's pushing into the wood surface. Like if you see me put that on my finger, if I'm pushing really hard, it's going to depress the pad of my finger. That's too much pressure. I want it to where it's just barely there and the wood doesn't know that it's actually being cut. So the less pressure you can put on the wood, the better. Uh, the other thing too is that revolving center point usually crushes those end grain fibers really bad. And that's why we gave ourselves that extra eighth of an inch or so so we can turn that off and get rid of that tear out and the, the, the torn fiber. So for me being a lefty, I'm supporting it with my right hand and then I'm kind of in an awkward position here. Um, for you guys that are right hand, you could definitely come over the top here and try and make that cut from here. I'm gonna try it right handed, I haven't done this one before. Just trying to support the piece and using my thumb as a more of a fulcrum. Swing that handle around and then raise it right there at the center point. So that wasn't too bad for not ever really turning right handed. I think that did okay. Let's stop the lathe and see uh, what it looks like the surface we have. So pretty good. There's a little bit of a tool mark here on the edge. On uh, the center point that'll sand out just fine. Um, but surface off the tool, really happy with that. So let's go ahead and sand this. Um, we'll throw our finish on and then we can part that off and then we can start hollowing out on um, the top. I think this one I could start sanding with 320. On the end here, I'm going to use my palm of my hand to help me radius that curve. The palm of your hand is nice and supple. It'll help conform to the radius shape that we have. It's looking really good. Okay, I'm gonna start sanding the coves. I wanna be very careful when I sand the transition from the half round to the cove, because I want these two points here to be nice and crisp, crisp detail lines. If you sand over those, it just rolls everything over and makes it uh, not look very good. So the crisp detail lines are a mark of craftsmanship. So you always wanna maintain that as much as possible. As far as the bead goes, I'm gonna sand that with 400. Anything finer, or sorry, coarser than that usually deforms the bead. And I wanna maintain this, the, like the perfect shape I have on the bead. So I'll start sanding that with 400 and it'll only be lightly sanding it anyway. Abernet, kinda of cool stuff, clears out really easy when you flick it. So this is 600. I've got a really good surface behind. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna grab some water and just a little strip of paper towel. Uh, right now I wanna wet sand this. I wanna raise the grain that I can sand back because um, a pacifier like this, a kid's gonna be chewing on, it's gonna be getting wet and I don't want it to get the grain raised and then be really rough and then people don't use it. So. I want to try and prevent that as much as possible. So raise the grain and then we'll sand it back. Uh, what happens is the water fills the wood fibers and makes them swell up. And then when the wood dries, it leaves this fuzzy um, peach fuzz behind basically rough surface. And what we want to do is once it dries, 
we'll sand that top layer of peach fuzz off, but we don't want to sand through that because then it exposes fresh wood fibers to then swell up again when they get wet. So, a little piece of wet paper towel. I'll turn this back on and then kind of friction dry it. While we're waiting for this to dry, um, one thing I want to mention as well on the design of the handle, you don't want the handle to be too big. Uh, you want a nice delicate handle, right? Because these are for babies. Um, too big of a handle, uh, they just won't use it. I turned one the other day, the handle was way too big. It's like three times as big as it needs to be. So um, keep in mind the proportions when you're doing your design. All right, now that we've let that dry, it's definitely fuzzy. I'm gonna go sand that off. Again, maintain that detail we have between the transition lines. Keep it nice and crisp. And then one last thing I'm gonna do is I'll burnish the surface. I just got a handful of the shavings we used. All right, now that we have our piece sanded, uh, we wet sanded it, got rid of the peach fuzz, we burnished the surface. It actually looks pretty good as it is with no finish on it. Um, but let's talk about finish selection. We want to make sure that what we're using is non-toxic because it is a kid's toy, something that they will be probably chewing on. Uh, make sure that it is a non-toxic finish. So I would stick with mineral oil, beeswax, or um, scratch freeze, what, what I'm going to use um, just to help refine the surface as well. But make sure what you're using is listed as non-toxic. So I'm going to grab a small piece of paper towel and get my scratch free here. This is a blend of um, some abrasive paste, basically, and some... Uh, non-toxic waxes and oils. So one thing I want to take mention of is I don't want to get scratch free on the tenon because I don't want it to strip that off to ensure a good glue joint later on down the road. So try and prevent that as much as possible. Uh, but if you get some on there, it's not that big of a deal. We can clean that up. I'm using some friction with the paper towel to help burnish the surface even more. And you can see that really enhancing the natural color of the wood. All right, that's ready to go. I'm gonna bring my tool rest back in. Make a terrible noise. Um, but now we can go ahead and part this off. Again, I'm gonna be parting one-handed here and then just catching the handle as it comes off. Got a little bit of nub there in the center. Just gonna chip that off with my skew. So that's the handle done. I don't have to worry about these little torn out fibers here. That's gonna be pressed in and glued, um, but the handle looks really nice. We've got a really good looking turning on the end. Got rid of that center point. Nice bead. It's a little off center. Um, it's almost far enough off center. It looks intentional. So, hey, if you screw up on the bead, no worries. Worst case scenario, you could always turn the bead off, so. Uh, handle looks pretty good though. I'm happy with that and I'm happy with the size of it too. It's a little bit smaller than this other one. I think this one's a little too bulky, um, but the one we just turned I think is a lot better weight and shape. So, so now we're going to turn the top. The orientation is going to be just like this. So we're going to rough profile the exterior, then we'll drill our hole and then hollow the center out. And fortunately we have enough material here. We can turn our little jam chuck that will then mount on in the tenon like that and we can turn the exterior at the top. All right, so we'll profile the exterior. So let's go ahead and turn the lathe back on. Actually, safety note, because we've been turning this for 15, 20 minutes, the wood uh, in the tent in there will have compressed slightly. So go ahead and make sure that your pinion gears are still snug on the chuck um, because we'll be putting a fair amount of pressure on this piece when we hollow it out. I don't want this thing coming out of the chuck on me, so.
far as overall profile, my bead's gonna be roughly right in here. I'm gonna be doing a semi-sphere on both sides. I'm gonna grab my parting tool and just give me a nice plunge cut there to give me clearance to roll that sphere. Using my right hand is basically the fulcrum as I swing that handle towards me and then close the flute as I get towards the center. That was a really choppy roll there. I want to establish my bead for the exterior here. Again, wiggle the handle back and forth. And I'm just reducing the diameter of it until it looks correct to me. I don't have an exact dimension I'm going for. I'm uh, just based on trying to match what I have here. So I think we're still a little bit oversized on the bead. And then I'm going to be turning the exterior of the cove, or sorry, the, the radius here to match the bottom of the bead. So a bunch of material here that needs to come off. The shape isn't really coming up, you know, isn't really appearing just yet. I'm just trying to get my bead established and the overall diameter of the exterior here first. The reason I want to establish the exterior before I hollow it is I want to know what my outside diameter and, and size is going to be. Uh, a lot of times you'll hollow the inside out and you don't know what the exterior needs to be. Um, and then when you go to turn the outside, you'll turn through the center because you're not really paying attention to your dimensions. But once I know my finished outside diameter, then I can hollow to it from the inside a lot easier. So that's the reason I do it that, that way. We've got a little bit of tear out on the bead just from being a fairly aggressive with it, so I'm gonna try and clean that up. Again, wiggling the handle back and forth. Let's check and see if that bead was cut clean. Still just a little bit of tear out on there. Okay, I can feel the tear out's gone now. Now we can finish getting our profile. Okay, I'm starting to come up looking nice. One other thing you can do too is on this exterior curve, you can go to a skew. A little negative rake scraper basically, and you can use that to feather that curve out if you're having a hard time controlling your spindle gouge. This is a lot easier to control and it, you can focus more on the shape than the tool technique because all you're doing is just gliding the tool handle back and forth is a lot easier. 
The other nice thing too is the long point of that skew. I can get into there up next to the bead and get a really clean, crisp edge. Okay, happy with that. I'm gonna rotate my tool rest slightly. And I'm gonna square off the base of this. I want a flat surface for my Forstner bit to drill into. And now we can go ahead and drill this out. So move your tool rest out of the way. We're gonna drop that speed down as well. This is roughly five, 600 RPM. Whenever you're using a Forstner bit, you always wanna slow it down. That's still just a little fast. Again, this is an 11 16th Forstner. You can use a standard twist, twist bit, whatever you got on hand. And then we'll slowly advance this in and drill out our depth. If you wanted to make things a little quicker, you can always tape your Forstner bit for the depth that you need. Uh, we've got another quarter inch or so to go. I think that's going to be just right. Okay, I've given myself about a quarter inch extra of material in the top end of this so I can use my hollowing tool to get to that. I don't want to get that done right up to my final depth with the Forstner bit because it is square across the top. Um, it's going to give me a different interior shape than I want. I want to have a nice rounded interior and that the hollowing tool is going to give me. So now we can take this out of the tailstock. And I'm going to finish profiling the top of this just a little bit more before we start hollowing that out. We'll bump that speed back up. And I'll use the spindle gouge to remove some of the bulk here. This will give me just a little more clearance to get in there with the tool and I'm not gonna be interfering with the, the piece of the waste block. Okay, that shape is really coming together now. I got a nice crisp radius. I'm gonna pick up the cut right there and I'm gonna stop right there. Um, I don't want to make that any smaller because I want as much support for this as we hollow it out because it puts a fair amount of pressure on the wood. So leave that as, as much support as you can and we can start hollowing this out. What I'll be using is just a little half inch scraper. I have custom ground into a little tiny hollowing tool. Um, you can take a close up kind of look at that. Just a half inch uh, scraper. I've cut a relief grind on the side to narrow it up and then I've got a small little radius on the top there and that'll give me the access I need to get in there. The other thing you could use too is one of the smaller Easywood hollowers or the Tchaikovsky hollowers. A bunch of different options. Um, custom grinding scrapers and a lot of times um, when you're wood turning, custom making your own tools out of um, scraper stock is really handy because there's a lot of times where, oh, I just need one tool that has a certain shape to, to get in there and make the cuts I need. So. Grinding your own tools is something that you should try looking into, so. Check my height. I think I'm a little low on the tool rest. I want to make sure that the bottom of the tool isn't going to contact the bottom of the bowl, or sorry, the bottom of the hole there. It looks like I've got clearance. So now I'm going to come over here from the end and I want to make sure that my hand is on top, or sorry, my forearm is on top of the tool handle because this gets a little grabby because it's not a negative rake. It's a standard grind and it gets a little grabby as soon as you start getting farther over the rest. Right now this is basically kind of blind hollowing. Um, I'm just visualizing where the cutting edge is, but you don't really have a, a perfect way of knowing exactly where it is. So um, stop the lathe and check your wall thickness frequently so you don't go through it. One other thing to mention, um, having a really cheap bendy straw from the gas station, super handy. On a small opening like this, 
you can blow that out and get all those shavings out of the way so you can check and get an accurate uh, measurement with your wall thickness. The other thing too is the opening here. Because we drilled it with a forger bit, I've got a nice square opening for my tenon to fit into and I don't want to cut into that with my hollowing tool. So make sure that you have a quarter inch shoulder in there and you don't touch it. Getting a little grabby. Good thing I have my hand on top of the handle. That way it doesn't kick up and get worse. Another thing to mention when you're hollowing these out, the thinner you go on this, the more noise you're gonna get. If it's a really thick wall thickness, it's gonna be really muted and quiet. So the thinner you can get, the more noise and action you're gonna get out of the rattle. The first one of these I did a few months ago was, was really thick on this, and I didn't realize it would make that much of a difference, but having the thinner walls um, while maintaining a thick enough wall to be durable, um, you wanna be as thin as you can, um, so you get a lot of noise out of it. So I'm getting a good curve on the inside, just using my finger to feel that. I still got a fair material up in the top end we need to remove. There's a little nub right in the center point I'm trying to get rid of. All right, so now that I've hollowed with this, I've done a few of these rattles with this without sharpening. I'm gonna go over to the grinder. I can tell it's really dull and it's just not cutting the way I want to, so I'll be right back. All right, I've just touched this up. We should be cutting a lot more efficiently now. That's one thing most turners usually neglect is sharpening. You always wanna make sure your tools are nice and sharp. One thing I'm doing with my scraper is I'm kind of rotating the handle to where it's less of an aggressive cut. Almost makes it kind of a negative rake a little bit. It's one thing you can try around. Let's go ahead and check that. Also, one thing to note, never stick your finger in the, in the bowl of that while it's spinning. Make sure the lathe is completely stopped. Okay, wall thickness. Sounds pretty good on the bottom half. Top half, I think, is still just a touch thick. Let's check our overall depth. Okay, we are right at the very end of that piece. So I'm not gonna hollow any deeper, I'm just gonna open up the sides here just a little bit more. And then I think we'll be good. The other thing too is the thinner you get, the more noise it'll make as you're getting thinner and it's the woods giving you a warning saying hey I'm getting thinner and thinner and then it gets really loud as soon as you're about to go through the wall so pay attention to the noise it, the tools and the wood are making when you're cutting okay I'm pretty happy with that though I think I might do I might do one more pass right here on this inside edge and then we'll be done Now that we have the bowl of that hollowed out, I want to check my tenon on the handle. That's beautiful. 
really nice snug fit. Having that mechanical bond as well as having the glue joint is going to give us a really secure hold together, these two pieces. I think that might be just a touch too tight because my tenon is slightly tapered. I'm going to open up the hole slightly. I'll use a spindle gouge for that. Bottom edge of the wing with the flute closed. Lightly grazing that surface. It's very, very close of a fit right now, so I don't want to oversize it. That's perfect. Okay, that'll be good for when we go to glue that on. So now I'm going to sand the exterior of this half and the bead, then we can part this off and flip it around on our jam chuck. Again, make sure you use proper dust protection whenever you're sanding. Um, obviously, like in our last or our previous videos, the reason I don't is just so you guys can hear me. And while we're sanding, we have some free time to chat. If you guys have any questions, throw those in the comment section below. I answer those directly myself. So don't hesitate to reach out or ask. And if you don't have any questions, hey, tell me what your current project is you're working on. Um, you could always tag us on Instagram, social media. I'd love to see what you guys are turning. Um, that's kind of the cool thing about the community of wood turners too is um, I love seeing what you guys are making. So please tag me, tag us on Instagram, Craft Supplies USA. Um, I, I, I'm on there as well. You can shoot me a DM on Instagram. But yeah. Let's get that dialogue going. I'd love to see what you guys are making. All right, that 320 grit's just a little too coarse to refine the shape that I want. So I'm gonna drop back down to a little coarser of a grit. Just help me profile that curve a little bit smoother. All right. Now we can jump back up to that finer grit. One thing I forgot to do is turn my lathe speed down. I was at 2500 RPM and that's just a little fast for sanding. Spindle work, it's not as big of a deal, but bowls definitely you wanna slow it down and especially if you're power sanding. That's looking pretty good. Let's go ahead and stop the lathe. Take a look. So I've got those coarser sanding scratches. Um, I believe I've lost my 240 grit. I'm gonna go find a sheet of 240 that I can get these scratches out with. All right, so I've got my paper I need to get those coarse sanding scratches out. Yeah, and if you guys could go ahead and like the video, that definitely helps YouTube's algorithm. It helps you find other cool videos like this. I'm gonna wet sand this as well. And right now I'm really only focusing on the bead in the bottom half because we'll sand the top uh, once we flip it around. But what a fun little project this is. People love these, you know, at craft shows. Um, this is a really fun project to do. Uh, my wife was saying, it, you know, if I put a small lanyard hole there, you could do some decorative ribbon on or a pacifier clip, something, you could clip it to the baby's shirt. You know, people really love that kind of stuff. So. Play around with different, you know, designs. There's a lot of options out there and you can really dress them up. You could get some food safe dye and dye the piece as well, make it look really attractive with some red or yellow or blue, some multicolored stuff. And a bunch of options for you. Now I'm gonna polish that, actually I'll burnish it first. Then I'll be using that scratch free again, making sure to not get scratch free in the opening there.
All right, now that the bottom half of that is done, we can go ahead and part this off. Got a little bit of rust on the lathe bed just from dropping some of the water on the rag. I'll throw some scratch free on that. There we go. All right, let's bump that lathe speed back up. Now we'll use our parting tool to part this off. And right now you can see I've given myself roughly an eighth of an inch extra material. Reason being is I want to part it off an eighth of an inch away from that uh, just in case the wood fibers tear as it cuts off. I don't want to have it tear off into the bowl of that and then have torn fibers that I can't cut out or get rid of. So always give yourself a little extra material that when you're parting something off. Because what happens is, is right at that center point, these fibers break out and I want to have enough material there I can turn and cut that cleanly. So there's the bottom half. There's the bottom half of the bowl. Looks really nice. Now we just got to finish the top half and then we can glue it to our handle and our baby rattle will be done. So now we need to size our tenon. I'll be using a skew with a peeling cut to do that. I'm gonna flip this over so I can see the whole diameter and give myself kind of a visual reference of what I need. And then a little tip is you can give yourself a small chamfer or a little taper and then you can test fit the piece and that'll give you a burnish mark of what the diameter needs to be. Let's go ahead and test fit this now. Very, very close. Almost slipping over the edge. You can see that burnish mark is right at that corner. Just taking the tiniest amount of material away and we should be able to fit. Okay, and what I've done is I gave myself a little bit of a taper so it gets bigger towards the headstock. Um, that way, just in case I undersize this, I still had material to work. So just remove a little bit of material past that burnish point. That looks like I might have taken too much material off. Let's see. I think we're gonna be okay. That's definitely snug. I wanna make sure that it's not too tight because I don't wanna split that piece, but I think we're good there. So, now we can bring our tool rest around and we can finish turning off the end. Then we'll sand and finish it and we'll be done. Tool rest is way low. I'm not sure why I dropped that so much. Just trying to cut that nice and clean. I don't want to have any torn fibers right at the end. I'm going to pick up the cut right at the end there because there's a tiny little nub. And just try and cut that nice and clean. Okay, that's ready to sand. I'm going to move my tools out of the way now. All right, I'm going to get rid of my tool rest as well.
If you wanted to, you could add some decorative grooves to the top, play around with a different style. Uh, but again, I'm using my palm to sand this because that'll contour to that curve much better than if I'm using my finger points because that'll give me a bunch of little facets. So make sure you use your palm to help radius and smooth that curve. Drop that speed down again, I forgot. That's my mistake. Again, you don't want to sand the bead with that coarse grit because it removes a lot of the detail in the curve and, and, and kind of screws it up a little bit. Okay, now we'll wet sand. Raise the grain, sorry. Give that a little friction dry. And you can feel how fuzzy that surface gets. I don't know if the camera can pick it up, but it's a rough finish. It feels like 400, 320 grit paper just from those wood fibers swelling up because of the water. Uh, one of the big mistakes guys do is they'll wet sand, but then when they go to sand it after the piece dries, they sand through that layer that they wet sanded, and then it exposes fresh wood that then the grain will get raised on again. So you want to do minimal sanding after you wet, uh, after you raise the grain on the piece. And then now we can put our scratch free on. Uh, again, Non-toxic finish is absolutely critical here. You don't want something that is poisonous. So now that the top is finished, I'm gonna pull that off the lathe. And for the fill of the top of the rattle, I'm gonna be using corn kernels. Um, you could use rice, you can use dried peas. There's a bunch of different um, food items you could put in there to make noise. Play around with some different things that you have at your house. Um, they'll make different noise as well. So I like the corn, uh, corn kernels, um, but let's go ahead and test that out. So really good sound. I think this one sounds even better than the oak. I think I got a little bit thinner on this one. Gives it a lot more noise and action to it. So really happy with that. So happy with that. Now we can go ahead and glue these two pieces together. Um, the bond between this and the upper piece is absolutely critical here. I don't want this coming apart down the road. So I'll be using a two-part epoxy. You could use wood glue, uh, but whatever you use, uh, make sure that it's, it's gonna be a really durable glued bond. I would stay away from CA glue. Um, I've found over time that stuff gets a little brittle and I don't want that coming apart, especially where this could be getting washed frequently. Um, make sure you use a durable epoxy or wood glue. So I'm gonna go get some stuff so I can mix this together and then we can um, glue the pieces together. All right, so I've got my plastic sheeting down. I'm gonna be using a two-part epoxy of equal amounts. I just try to make sure that the droplet sizes are equal and we don't need a lot of epoxy for this project. So I'm gonna use a small straw just to thoroughly mix these two pieces together. Okay, I'm just gonna let that sit for a second. Get my two pieces that we will be gluing together. Um, one thing to mention, make sure you have your rattle material in this before you glue it together, because it's really exciting that you'll glue this together and you realize you forgot the fill material. So make sure you have that in there before you start. And then we'll just lightly apply a thin layer to the tenon and the inside of that hole. The nice thing about working with an epoxy like this is it gives you working time. I've got five minutes to put these parts together and I'm not in a rush where if you're doing CA glue, you coat everything and you're trying to hurry and, and put it together before the glue sets or worst case, it sets as it's halfway on. So light, light coating on the inside, light coating on the tenon and then I'm gonna twist this as I press it together. You 
use my other rattle. Just give that a nice firm tap to seat everything. And then I'll get a rag to clean up any excess glue that I have. I might have put just a touch more epoxy on than I needed, but I'd rather have um, a little excess that I need to wipe off instead of having this come apart in the future. So another thing to mention too, is I will try and keep this upside down as much as possible, just in case there's epoxy inside the hole. I don't want the corn kernels being glued together. So I'll leave that to sit for about 10, 15 minutes, and it should set up well enough that we can then go ahead and use it. So we'll leave that for five to 10 minutes, and we'll come back. All right, so we've let the baby rattle sit for about 10 minutes and let that epoxy cure enough to where we can now use it and work with it. Um, really happy with the shape though. I think it's a really classic shape, um, more of a Victorian era style. Um, really good sound out of it. Um, it's nice and light too. That's the one thing I've noticed after turning a handful of these is um, the first ones I did were a little heavy and bulky um, and this one's got a really good light weight to it um, and the sound is really, really nice. So play around with a bunch of different styles, give it a shot, tag us on Instagram when you do it because I'd like to see whatever you're turning. Um, go ahead and like the video and leave a, leave a comment below as well. Um, but stay tuned for the next video and thanks guys.